Ready to call? Uh, one minute, just <laughs> Yeah. Oh, here, I see it, yeah. Okay. But the wire yeah. is like caught. It's my problem. Yeah, it's like caught in your hair. I'm entangled. Sorry. <laughs> I could hold it like this. <laughs> Very Twitch stream. It's a uh, cotton in her head. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's at the spot. Oh, yeah, it fell somehow. <coughs> testing, testing, can you hear me? Yeah, well, nice. We can grab a vocal mic from Mary, maybe. If you can. Hello, hello. Hello. Yeah, I won't need it after either. If you can. Okay. Okay, let's start. Uh, uh, welcome to session called uh, Pixel X, X Orston House, of Rehearsing Hospitalities uh, Program or Catering for Rehearsing Hospitalities Program. Uh, I'm not gonna do because I'm kind of trying to see it. Many of you have been here also in the morning, so I'm not going to do a full introduction, but something. Uh, I'm Jussi Koitala, head of program at Frame Contemporary Art Finland. And this session is uh, like uh, moderated by, moderated or planned with uh, and curated with Mary Conlon and Steve Maher, Mary from Orston House and Steve from uh, Pixel Lake. Like. Uh, so I just say very pra few practical things in the beginning and then give the space for you. Uh, uh, so it was this said also in the earlier. Uh, we are also streaming this this sound uh, from the from the session online. So if you are speaking, commenting, question, have a questions or something like that, please speak into microphone and very close by. If you have this handheld microphone. Uh, and then there's a live captions appearing there and on this kind of visual mapping uh, about the content of the pro session. A uh, few other things. Uh, uh, please respect, there's a safer spaces guidelines on the door and like let's, let's try to be uh, good to each other in the space. Uh, and then I at the last want to say other think that if you have any COVID symptoms, please uh, um, think if you are <laughs> don't be in the space or there's also masks in the lobby. There is a, um, a risk at risk persons participating in this session. So just just to want to uh, highlight that aspect too. Um, Mary and Steve, I think you can start from here. Thanks very much. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Pixel Lake X Ormson House, or you could equally say Ormson House X Pixel Lake. Uh, I, I don't think the order in which we're multiplied matters so much, um, but it, the multiplication is uh, to do with the collaboration that we're presenting for you today. Um, so a bit of background, um, I'm a member of Pixel Lake, I was their producer between 2018 to 2021. I was the producer for two festivals and the program that was in between the two festivals. And I was a member for a long time, and I'm still a member, of course. <laughs> not was, I still am. And uh, although I, I'm certainly not as involved in day-to-day -day stuff anymore. Um, but um, UC contacted uh, me earlier in the year uh, about you know maybe doing something for this event. And we kind of had a couple of conversations, and then the idea of, um, of working with Ormston House uh, came up naturally, and um, you know, it, it, to me, it it um, it was just a really nice thing to try and do because 
we have a history of attempted collaborations. Um, and also, I was a member of Ormson House uh, approximately 10 years back. Uh, it was probably one of the first things that I did in terms of uh, my creative career. I was the... Uh, I can't remember what my title was or anything, to be honest, but I was there with everyone else, but we were all stuck in the muck uh, doing the hard work, uh, for sure. And um, I, I left, but people like Mary and Neve stayed and, uh, you know, really transformed what it was. So I can't lay any claim to anything that Orson House is today, uh, which is just this amazing cultural resource uh, centre uh, in the heart of Limerick, uh, in a beautiful space. and. I really encourage you to check it out. But the space is just a backdrop to just uh, an amazing program of events and uh, happenings and all sorts of things that take place in Limerick and really offer something that uh, just wasn't there before. And I think that's that's really uh, a fantastic thing. Um, yeah, you know, I love you too. I love you too. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, we, me and Mary, we're, we were in conversation throughout the, the, the last year, basically, um, trying to design what the collaboration might be. And we had a couple of uh, different tangents that we went on through those conversations. And eventually, we settled on what you're about to see today. And I'm more inclined to let the event speak for itself. Also, I'm improving my uh, like thing right now, so I don't want to make a fool of myself. So I think you'll understand that. Um, but there isn't really much more else for me to say, um, to be honest. Uh, I, 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 I can't think of anything else to say except to w welcome you all. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. So Thank you, Steve. I forgot probably about half of what I said I would say. But yeah. That's OK. Um, and to kind of contrast the styles, I've written down what I'd like to say. So if you don't mind, I, I'm going to, to read um, before we start. Uh, so my name is Mary Conn, and I just want to say, first of all, that you're very welcome and thank you for being here, uh, both in person and to those joining us online. Um, so last February and March, uh, I was here for the Helsinki International Curators Programme, which is organised by Frame Finland, and I had proposed to work on an evolving research project started in 2017 called the Feminist Supermarket which began quite innocently from the fact that Wormston House is located in the building that was the first supermarket in Limerick. And in the 1960s, the marketing slogan for the supermarket was, and I quote, if you haven't visited us yet, you're robbing your husband. <laughs> so this research coincided um, with the height and completion of a long and difficult process of purchasing the property uh, with both private and public funds and negotiating a long-term lease at a peppercorn rent from local government. So we pay a rent of 100 euros per year for the use of our space. Uh, so in Ireland, th this is not commonplace um, for self-organizing community-led art spaces to achieve this kind of security or respect, I would argue, uh, especially when the building is in a highly visible location, when the architecture is based on a Venetian palazzo, and especially when it is owned by a capital investment company, or as we might call it, a vulture fund. Um, so what was interesting during this process was to realize who thought they had power and who actually had power in, in the city. Um, and you can read more uh, about my colleague Neve Brown's experience. So uh, Neve Brown was mentioned by Steve earlier, who I work with at Ormston House. So she recently did an interview for the Journal of Irish Arts Management and Cultural Policy, and it's available for free online. Um, and when I was in Helsinki, I was assisting another colleague, Cayman Walsh, in the republishing of an essay by Steve Maher uh, for a project he was curating, drawing on the Public Dance Hall Act of 1934, when under pressure from the Catholic Church, uh, the Irish state banned jazz and foreign music um, from being broadcast on Irish radio. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that act is still in uh, existence today. The Dance Hall's Act is still in existence, but the ban is... Uh, has, has been... been Uh, so this was uh, described, so jazz music was described by a priest as an engine of hell. And um, this was the title of the project, and which also inspired Steve to write his original essay. So that essay, Crossroads by Steve Maher, is also available to read for free on our website, if anybody would like to follow up. Uh, so as you can imagine, I was delighted when UC proposed a collaboration between Pixel Lake and Ormston House, which turned into a professional, a professional reunion of sorts between myself and Steve in the context of rehearsing hospitalities. 
Uh, as Steve mentioned, Pixel Lake and Wormson had tried to collaborate before. I was a programmer during Limerick's bid for European Capital of Culture in 2016. And I was in touch with Andrew and other members of the team to develop a project for which we would take four years to learn how to work together towards a festival on the River Shannon in Limerick City. And the theme myself and the other programmers for the ECOC bid decided upon for the bid was belonging. And for me, this came from a conversation I had with an employee at an organization called GOSH. And GOSH stands for Gender Orientation, Sexual Health and HIV. And it was a conversation on the marriage referendum. So Ireland was the first country in the world to vote for marriage equality by a landslide majority. And this person said to me, yes, the referendum has passed, but now I have to learn how to belong. And this is something that really stayed with me. So I'm especially grateful to UC for reconnecting us through rehearsing hospitalities and for the opportunity to do some time traveling with Steve. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about Wormston House, I'm happy to talk after the session. I would also like to point to two essays that we commissioned that are available also for free on our website. The first is Useful Curating by Dr. Stephanie Bertrand, which draws on Arte Utile, which we heard about yesterday, and extended mind theory in the context of curatorial practice. And the second essay, which is called I Remember Dreaming with Friends by Dr. Hosea Barcinia, uh, who discusses precarity and alternative residency models in the arts. So before starting the first part of our event, I just want to say some thank you. So I'd like to thank Libu and Reshab uh, for their production and communication support, and to Stella and all the team at Frame for the warm welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank Pixel Lake for the freedom to explore ideas with Steve and to Steve for his patience and generosity in our conversations. Likewise. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Ono Dowd for collaborating with Steve for the final musical and dialogical part of our event today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, L. Reed Buckley and William Keohan uh, for coming from Ireland to participate in today's event and I'm looking forward very much to your contributions today. And I must thank Culture Ireland for also supporting your travel. And Lastly, I would like to thank Vishnu Vardani Rajan and Isa Hoka for agreeing to join us for the Roundtable Conversation and who I will now introduce to start our event. So. Okay, so I will start with Isa. So you're very welcome, Isa, thank you. Um, so Isa Hoka is a writer, artist and philosophy student uh, they are based here in Helsinki, although parts of them will always live in Pohos Poyanma, Copenhagen, and Montreal, Jojo Gay. I hope I pronounced that. Um, no, but <laughs> we will get there. Thank okay, you. Okay, you can, you can tell me how to pronounce that. Yes. Uh, in addition to participating in radical access and care, grassroots organizing, and making performances in Helsinki, they have worked with translating. Various magazines have also published their award winning Queer Crip Poetry. This year, they are facilitating Rampa Associations, an international working group of chronically sick artists that performs at the Baltic Circle International Theatre Festival in November 2022. Isa wants to continue um, exploring crip political theory and action, creating more sustainable and trauma-informed working structures for crip sick artists and dancing with questions of pleasure, pain. So you're very welcome, Isa. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Um, next, I would like to introduce Vishnu Vardani Rajan, uh, who is a body philosopher, performance artist, and filmmaker. They are a hyphenated identity, multidisciplinary practitioner who builds connections between art, science, witchcraft, history, and the cultures that define them. They explore shame through dance, acting, and stand-up comedy. <laughs> Instrumental to their praxis is their intent to oscillate between cultures, languages, methodologies, and sexual identities, each different from the other. Sleep, rest, conflict, and nutrition are both their research interests and recurring themes. Vishnu's drag king persona is Vamp Master Brown. <laughs> Vishnu has proudly been bastardizing yoga practices since 2005, and since an orthopedic enhancement in their knee, is a self-proclaimed cyborg witch. So you're very welcome, Vishnu. Thank you. Um, and finally, uh, L. Reed Buckley, who is on my left, is a sociologist, writer, and collage artist based in Limerick City in Ireland. They are currently completing a PhD in sociology on bisexualities in post-marriage equality Ireland. 
Their research, writing, and artistic practice is broadly focused on issues of genders and sexualities, with research interests in a wide number of areas such as trans theory, pop culture, media studies, archival and memorial practices, excuse me, and the politics of space. Overall, their work aims to connect art, academia, and activism to celebrate the beauty, joy, and diversity of queerness and trans identity. So you're very welcome. Ellen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so you're all very welcome. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to join us today. And I was wondering if we could start, if you could maybe um, let the audience know what are you currently working on? Is there something, a project you're currently working on or that you've been working on recently that you could share with us? Yeah, I can go first. Um, and again, <laughs> so, so good to be here. And thank you all for coming. Hey, kaikki, hey, sanalla. Um, so currently I'm working as a facilitator, as it was mentioned in a, in a project. And our working group is called Rampa Associations. And Rampa is uh, one of the translations I've worked with uh, from like English to Finnish to have crip, uh, critical disability vocabulary. Um, so yeah, I'm facilitating that project. Uh, we have an amazing group of, wait, are we five or six <laughs> uh, disabled artists? And we're doing a performance for the Baltic Circle International Theatre Festival. And with that facilitating, I'm really, gosh, like I'm with the structures. They are everywhere in my thoughts almost every day currently, because our project comes from the question, like, how can we as queer creep artists even work? How can we work in these structures that are demanding uh, able-bodiedness, able-mindedness, horrible, like, r like speed, and these very, yeah, demands of productivity, basically. So how does one as a disabled, sick artist even work, even be in the institutions, even be in these working groups? How do we communicate? How, how do we do all of this? So we are really in this uh, process creating the structures that we need. And what I've noticed so far is they need to be trauma-informed, for example, which is a huge topic, as, as many here know. They need to be flexible, they need to be softer, they need to be able to take into account um, this artist's individuality and people's needs. Um, yeah, so these are a couple of thoughts <laughs> what I'm, I'm working with currently. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. How about you? Thank you. I just feel like I want to drop everything and follow you and participate in everything you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Please yeah. do. I would, yeah, thank you. Mm, what am I currently busy with? Mm, uh, in my personal practice, I'm doing many things, uh, but as uh, an extension of community building practice, I'm working on uh, complaint making, which is called convivial complaint cell. Um, and then also thinking through like conflict positivity as um, complaint uh, community building practice. And this does not mean that like you enter a space and like start to have a fight, but to know that when a group is coming together, that there may eventually be a conflict and that maybe very small, um, which could be like preferences of food or um, or not knowing certain vocabulary ar around how to address certain topics or something larger like having very different opinions on how to take the uh, budget forward when you have a plan for a project. So all these are part of that and uh, Convivial complaint cell is basically using non uh, uh, or something that I came up with in 2019 called no performance performance uh, that Fred Morton talks about the non performativity of uh, some folk in the world where you know like you are making a performance just by being there uh, so 
when you're a person of color, when you're entering into a space with a wheelchair, or when you're a mother that is, um, you know, there are performative actions that are actually part of your daily life. Um, and then that, that basically, the complaint cell work uh, has been on for like two, uh, nearly two and a half years now, which started off as like a personal angst on like, okay, every space I enter, uh, something goes amiss, who do I speak with? And then that came about. And the other thing came um, as, a refle or, uh, as a response to working with complaint making and trying to set up conflict positivity spaces, which is infinite playlist afterisms, which also addresses what Adrian Marie Brown talks on, like pleasure activism, you know? Like f certain folk are constantly working on like what's not working, what do we need? And, but what is the space of pleasure then? Like what brings us joy? So infinite playlist aphorisms is just about that, like a space where something, I mean, coming together in joy uh, and afterisms is also a term that, like uh, in French, it's uh, réplique d'escalier, where because I'm a slow thinker, even though um, uh, I may be talking very fast, but like a, a, a something occurs uh, to me 20 days later, I'm like, I could have said that. I don't know if you, any of you have this, like there's a conflict, and then like, oh, damn it, I could have said that, I could have said that. So that word, I um, think of it as an afterism, and Urban Dictionary defines it better. Um, yeah, those are like my community building, part of my community building uh, projects at the moment, and also supported by Pixel8. Thank you, Pixel8. I'm also a member of Pixel8 uh, and a chair for 40 days, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just to say first, it's like such a joy to be able to share this space with both of you. Yeah, so same. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to Mary and to Frame and to Pixelag for putting us all together, and also to Shia Conlon for for uh, suggesting you know, both of you to me. Um, I suppose, as Mary mentioned, uh, I'm very uh, s much struggling <laughs> to finish my PhD at the moment. Um, because uh, I am, one, both consistently uh, exhausted by the bureaucracy of an institution that does not want to um, support queer and trans work, um, but I'm also bound by the fact that um, in Ireland it's not really common to be funded for your studies, so I currently try to do random freelance work to pay my rent and feed my dog Frank. <laughs> so uh, a lot of my life at the moment is, is taken up in kind of negative affect. So this is really nice to be able to experience joy for the first time in a really long time. Um, I suppose the last time that I did something really, really um, great in terms of like artistic practice, um, was uh, during the summer, um, Ormston very kindly supported um, a publication that I wrote um, on the work of Irish artist Frida Lynch on her series Blue Dyke, um, and that was designed by um, my colleague Oshin Ralph, and um, it was just really nice to be able to uh, create a program with Ormston for Alternative Pride in Limerick, which was the first time that we've been able to have like a very queer-centered um, and like political response to pride that wasn't um, very commercialized, very pink washed um, and not kind of uh, not engaging with the community as it was. Um, I also run a queer discussion group um, called Alter, which is an Irish word for the other place um, in Limerick. And it was very much born out of uh, my department cut the funding for the queer reading group. So I said, fuck it. Let's take the reading group and pirate all the readings and share that with people who aren't in university. Um, and then the last thing that's coming, um, that's going to come out soon, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, is Will in the room? Uh, yeah. 
uh, we wrote a collaborative piece with a couple of our friends on, um, on binding as a trans masculine people. Um, so that's going to come out in November. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm conscious, easy to pick up on what you said as well about like having the time to negotiate and understand. And I also, I think I, I do need to say that our invitation to you came quite late. This was a, uh, we are very grateful we got some funding from Ireland, which was, which meant we were able to invite local artists, which we had wanted to do from the beginning. So I'm very conscious that our negotiation was, was quite short, but even, and Yussi um, alluded to this yesterday about this front end and the back end of working about decentralization and, and all this work that we're talking about over the course of these days, but how much learning I have had in our email exchange since. And a lot of what you have taught me about like the requirements I have now, um, you know, with our team are gonna try and bring these in is actually these are, this is standard behavior and also how reciprocal you made it about what I, what I would like from you. And it was a really, really beautiful exchange and I wanted to thank you for that because I, I am very conscious it was a very, you know, short lead in, in time for you. So I want to thank you very much for it. Yeah, for I, I wanna mention that. So what also Mary is talking about is like, uh, in these emails I do use like a very short version of an access rider uh, in Finnish, which is like something um, uh, I and other people, Jemina Lindholm, Aku Merilainen, and many uh, wonderful disabled artists have been like developing in the Finnish context. So Access Rider is, it can be a document, it can be a, I don't know, let's be creative, it can be a video, it can be an audio tape, it can be a piece of art, uh, where basically people are expressing their needs. Uh, trying to practice saying things like, hey, Mary, I'm, I, I'm glad to join this event. Here are my needs. I communicate, you know, directly and this way, and I don't use WhatsApp. Like, <laughs> it can be many things, but then it's also, you know, due to my sickness, like, I don't lift anything heavy, or I need your help with this one, or can I help you with something? So Access Writer is a, yeah, some kind of a piece that tries to open the discussion. It can never, you know, grasp the, like it's, it's not meant to be a 20 page book that tells or your, all your needs because they're gonna also change. It's flexible when we are accommodating people and addressing people's access needs and other needs seriously. So, that, but they are great conversation starters. So that also helped me to articulate with you because I already had this kind of a concrete tool. And please read uh, Yemi Lalil Toms and Jesse Bolivan's publication uh, on this. It's uh, published by Frame. Yes, exactly. And actually, th this brings me to so um, a core question that um, myself and the team at Ormson House always um, go back to, and it's really central to, to our thinking, is how can we support artists better? Um, so I was wondering if I could put that question to you. How can Ormson House or other like people, other organizers, event organizers, people who work in institutions or organizations who may be in the audience who may want to or need to hear for example, of uh, what are your needs? So how can we support you better to do your work? Do you want me to go first? If you're happy to. We'll get the yelling out first. Um, <laughs> I suppose, uh, like I, by chance, I suppose I'm an artist um, and I don't really consider myself an academic first, uh, but I engage mostly with academic institutions in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think the biggest thing that um, academic institutions can do is stop lying to people and stop telling them that they're going to be able to get a job straight out of their PhD if they just work hard enough, if they just get enough grants, if they just, if they just try harder, if they had better research. All research is valid as long as it's not like infringing on the rights of other people or is, you know, problematic in some way but like particularly from my experience um, there is such a privilege given to people who have acquired grants in the same way that if you are not funded or self-funded or are in my case a bit controversial <laughs> um, they don't want to hear about you and they don't want to be a hear about your research um, and particularly 
I think that's something that I've been talking a lot with um, my friend, um, who's an artist and writer, Podrick Robinson, who's based in Berlin, would recommend you check out Podrick's work, um, that there's so much we can learn from artistic methodologies and practices that we can bring into social sciences in different ways, um, such as kind of conditions around uh, ethics and uh, like care practices, which I think we've talked about a lot on our Zooms and stuff. Um, but what I've encountered a lot in institutions is really what I would deem transphobic research calls, where I have been asked to participate in research by cis heterosexual researchers who have clearly never met a trans person in their life, who are referring to them using slurs in their research, who are doing incredibly invasive research, and there's like no care given to that. But these have all been approved by boards of people who are largely cis het white male academics. And like the only thing that I can see about that is like is hiring people, hiring people who aren't repeating the same structure over and over again. Like in my university at home, like they're well able to take pictures of students of color or queer students and use them for marketing purposes. There is not that reflection in the staff. Um, I was told recently that we couldn't have an LGBT staff network because there wasn't going to be enough queer people to fill that up if we didn't include allies. And my personal motto is I don't work with straight people unless I have to, or you're Mary Conlon. Um, so, uh, you know, like the, there's, there's a lot of things there, and I don't know if we'll get this, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking so much. I go like on, on rampages, but I wonder like, is there like a benefit of like an exclusive space or is that really problematic? Like, is that contributing again to like different types of gatekeeping if we stop talking to people? But I think at the moment I'm like so burnt out from working in spaces where people like fundamentally cannot recognize my needs or my identity that I just like cannot see myself working in this after the thing is submitted. Sorry. That's okay, thank you for <laughs> that. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and just to say that actually the events that you organized in Wormson House for Pride because you were a really key driving force to that. I know there were lots of people who, who gave their, their time and energy to it, but the sense of community was really extraordinary and I and all the team felt so part of it. It was just a really beautiful experience. And that for me was, I remember having the conversations with Steve and I was like, I would really love to, you know, bring this, these ideas, a way of working and thinking to the context of rehearsing hospitalities, because it was really, the city felt different for that week that there was, and every single event was oversubscribed. <laughs> um, and it was just a really, really, sorry, I'm getting, gonna get teary now. I'm <laughs> going to look away. Um, and it was a really, really beautiful week. So I wanted to thank you for that. So my mind went blank there. So I'm going to move on to uh, Vishnu. Um, Vishnu, how can we support artists better? Say it again. How can we support, so to go back to the, the question, so how can we support better? artists better? Uh, yeah, I would like to pick on, uh, not pick on L, but like pick on what <laughs> you said, um, uh, on like stop lying um, to people. And I was also thinking earlier from our earlier conversation on this aspect of like dating, like how honest would you be if this was going to be an intimate relationship on which you're going to build something uh, something together, like where you're, yeah, it's going to be, um, okay, I lost my thought there, but to come back to something, uh, very nice article about like decentralizing power, and I, uh, all through the, um, this article that UC wrote, I kept thinking about what does it actually mean to decentralize power, and uh, then I started to like make some notes and something that occurred to me that there is no one power to decentralize it yeah. because there is the material aspect, there are like resources and then we all have different kinds of powers. If I may be a bit naughty uh, <laughs> 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 and use uh, you see to make a little joke, um, I probably am a better speaker or like a better comic when compared to like someone else. 
So if um, I'm coming and saying that uh, this is my power, I'm able to articulate really well. I can present my thoughts clearly on stage, and I can uh, do a perfect stand-up set. That is actually my power. So I'm telling you what kind of a power I have. So then you know how that power can be used. Um, but institutions often like uh, um, hide behind um, words that are very vague. Um, <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you. And uh, so instead of thinking through like this one power uh, aspect or like, you know, some kind of a hero's journey to like just say that, okay, these are all the resources we have. This is the kind of power we have. And this is how we can support you. So then it actually becomes like, OK, do I want to then get into this relationship with this space? You know, um, So that's like already doing a lot by just saying what is possible within this institution. So it, um, that's like another aspect of like not lying, uh, where like, you know, OK, then you want to get into this engagement or not. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pick up maybe on one of our previous conversations that we, um, we've had together as well around, uh, that I think picks up on this as well, is like knowing how to behave yeah, in yeah, a space yeah. and this idea of the, the professional. And I think yes. you had, a, a, as part of your practice, you were working on the politics of proper. Yes. I, wonder I had a performance piece um, that's called Politics of Proper, where there's a certain decorum that's always expected of you on, like, um, uh, something can get, like, very badly lost in translation. For example, if someone tells me, use indoor voice, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> so I can speak really loud or like, you know, so, uh, or I mean, I, I'm just using that as a strange example, but uh, there is there is something that is expected as being professional, like responding to your emails right away or, mm -hmm. uh, so then that goes uh, to uh, to this place of like ignoring the needs of the person, so I have to like send a rider that you know I have an administrative fatigue and I can uh, I'm doing many things because I'm also hustling for money uh, and I also have a supermarket job, so like you know it, I'm doing other things than making art because I need money to survive or I need uh, a job actually in order to. Uh, continue to live in Finland. So then uh, this being professional uh, or like uh, one, uh, because it's a skill, no? Being able to like attend to your email became uh, the most important skill that the people that uh, respond to their emails become like uh, advanced faster versus and so on. So to me, yeah, all those go into this space of like the politics of proper and each each uh, institution or association always has this like, uh, and so like, yeah, you could like also look into like, what do you deem being professional within like your, uh, your space? Would either of you like to pick up on that? I know we had talked about it before, but maybe you may or may not. Well, I can provide an interesting example also, like how to be a professional as a disabled sick person when, for example, you know, majority of some days I need to lie down. I lie down in the metro. I lie down in your clo close by park. I lie down in spaces like these. And it's amazing that how people react and what kind of assumptions people have. Like, is that person intoxicated somehow? Are they okay? Are they, what is happening? Just like someone being horizontal is somehow like, yeah, some people cannot overcome it. So like, when you are actually not able to mm. also in many ways feel some like also unsaid like <sighs> assumptions and especially like I'm neurotypical 
But as I've learned over the years, especially from uh, great autistic uh, artists and activists and organizers, that's, that's one of the biggest issues. It's not said out loud. It's just assumed that people know how to perform and act in these spaces in order to present like some kind of a professionality. Mm. Is that even professionality? Or is that just like neurotypical norms, uh, ableism, whiteness, thinness, <laughs> like all these things? Yeah. Open question. Yeah, if I may also share uh, um, an anecdote. I have been lucky to find a spot at Poimu Space. It's a um, feminist co-working space in... Uh, um, and there, uh, it has been always like this because uh, I'm also neuroatypical and uh, my superpower is to focus on multiple things at the same time. <laughs> and they call it ADHD. And uh, <laughs> uh, the... Um, uh, uh, something that I realized, like a conversation happens, there's a recording of it. Uh, and uh, mm, you can like, I, I can get this because in between a conversation I'm trailing off, uh, something else happens. And then if there is an important message that needs responding right away, uh, there is actually like a date given on like by when it is uh, required to like, get the things moving so you kind of like prepare and uh, i i thrive on deadlines so when <laughs> when i know okay this is like due in a week then i'm like preparing myself so that's another like it's a very practical tool but to like say can, would you be able to respond by so and so date um, i mean i don't know why i'm talking so much about emails but <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. quite okay. <laughs> uh, do you want to I, I just wanted to like touch on something that both of you brought up earlier in our conversations that I am inspired so much about about like thinking about like radical care and how you like particularly for me like finding queer community and finding trans community. Shout out to Will again for facilitating that in Limerick. Um, that like that was where I finally felt safe. But I'm particularly as an Irish person so interested in your like part of your identity is shameless because that is so ingrained in like our lives to be to feel shame yeah. about everything and something that has really affected like my ability to be seen as professional is if I have a crisis of mental health so I just burst out crying if I feel really overwhelmed, which happens all the time. Um, but there is like, you know, this consistent thing of like, you can't do this in your viva, you can't do this in an interview, like you need to like build up resilience. But I also like question about like, what what is the institution itself doing to create resilience? And like, if we can only find that, in external communities that aren't in like the places where we work or the places where we do practice, the places where we exhibit, like are we always going to be bound to like an emotional politics that is rooted in normalcy or what people say it's normal? Mm. And how do you like struggle against that? Is it just being yourself all the mm. time? Does that mean you're consistently constrained to the margins? Yeah. I, I, that's kind of what I'm like struggling with a lot at the moment is like where, where do you position yourself within that like emotional politics that is like so ingrained in the institution? I think is brought up in the last session well, as well about like emotion and, and how that's not really talked about. Yeah, thank you for bringing that aspect um, of uh, shame because I, I feel like the influence of religions are so strong that uh, um, some Christian religion like folk who are born and raised in that space I experienced like a lot of guilt so like you have to be a good parent you have to be a good worker and so on and so forth and when you don't have that there's a lot of guilt and then um, I'm cultured like with another umbrella of like the Hinduism where you have to like um, be shy and perform like these kind of femininity where um, everything is about like um, um, yeah, like it's structured around this aspect of shame. 
shame. Uh, so when I moved to Finland, so it's uh, 10 years now, 8th of March, my uh, first encounter was like people uh, expressing this identity of being, being shy uh, was very interesting. And uh, the aspect of sh shame was also coming like I kept juxtaposing myself on like, so I'm able to reach out to people. So what does that mean? Am I not shy? So then I started to embrace that identity. But then I realized like, oh my God, even in retrospect, uh, I am. I have been shameless, but back at home, people identified that as uh, being queer. But then I realized, like, okay, so they are somehow like very intertwined. And then I start to realize, like, okay, queer, not as in gay, but as in trying to escape definition, uh, trying to escape the norms, trying to escape, uh, yeah, something that is assumed as as um, um, as as a given no so when what um, uh, what's his name uh, uh, something Schulz who wrote about like the stranger so then I'm um, that kind of a stranger who is um, constantly standing in contrast with uh, what is the norm <laughs> and therefore for me that identity somehow became so much more important Mm, uh, in order to like be in, in spaces. But that also means that I'm, uh, with that identity, it's almost like my cloak, that I can go into a space like, yeah, there are, there are people in the room that have hurt me in the past, or I have hurt in the past, uh, or I have some, a conflict may have happened, but I'm able to sit there and like speak up. And uh, for that, like that identity became or it becomes important like to say again and again that, mm. yeah, I can be here. I'm not an imposter, I'm just shameless. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask how we're doing for time? I'm conscious the morning session went over. Do I have time for another question, you see? Uh, one short one. Uh, could I answer, I'm trying to be brief, to the question of how to support artists, um, how, how institutions could. Uh, there are many ways to analyze this, but I always, I would say two things are vital. Access, so accessibility, saavutettavuus, as a radical, all-encompassing thing, not an afterthought. Like if I, I'm founding or working in an institution, am I like, hey, we're organizing all these programs and inviting all these people and making all these events and building these buildings. Oh, the building's not accessible for people with wheelchair. Oh, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Like the access needs to be there from the start. The access of like, who are we granting access to? Is this place, is this space at all accessible in so many ways, financially, physically, um, mentally, for, for sick people, for non-white people, like all these things. Is it there or is it just an afterthought? And then the other thing I say briefly is also like, I, <laughs> we have forgotten, I feel often, the structural analysis, the great tools that we already have, the leftist working class analysis, like how, why do we talk about some like cool new programs and accessibility when we don't pay our employees enough or we have working hours of like 12 hours a day. Oh my God, so yeah. These basic things, we already know them. We have them. We need to get out of this capitalist grind. We need to get back to the anti-capitalist roots. I'm serious, like it's frustrating sometimes. Amen. Um, Thank you. I am going to, just because you brought up Feminist Culture House before, I'd, I'd like to read a quote, actually, yes. them, if I may. And then, because um, I might ask them at the end, if we c if where can people find out about your work? So I'm going to read this quote, and then if you have a parting thought you'd like to share with the audience and where people can find out more about your work. But um, I'm going to read this um, quote. And during my residency at the beginning of this year, UC had recommended that I visit uh, Feminist Culture House. And it was I just had an amazing experience with them. So this is a conversation between Kid Coco and Orlan Ortonen. 
and the quote reads, uh, gender diversity cannot be a fashion phenomenon that produces interesting content, but does not change oppressive structures. Organizations and institutions have to take responsibility for getting rid of cis sexism. No more diversity on the account of the oppressed peoples. The oppressive structures do not change without the voices of the oppressed people. Trans people and other gender minorities must be listened to. We have things to say. Mm. So I wonder if, we, if you had a parting thought before we end, and also if you can let everybody know where we can find out more about your work, please. And thank you. Um, may I go first? Yes. Uh, something that I wrote in uh, my um, notebook uh, was also like from our earlier conversation because Bill was saying that there's always the good and bad that like, uh, and I have been working with this aspect of like utopic pessimism that, you know, things may go like haywire, uh, everything may go to shit, but we are here with hope, and what Maria Makaba says that hope is a discipline, that we are here despite uh, of everything. So, like dinosaurs went, but we are here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I would love to leave you with Maria Makaba's quote. And how can we know about your work? How? Uh, actually, just to, through my Instagram, so please like, follow, and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I guess um, I would love to end with a note that I mentioned when we uh, planned this um, discussion, which is there, there is no single trans perspective. I think it's really important. I feel sometimes that, you know, our intentions are good. I've, I've also done this like years ago, probably all the time, but like saying things like, oh, what, what do the trans people think about this? You know, hey, hey, Isa, what do the disabled <laughs> artists want? Like, oh my God, <laughs> you see, like there are, it's such a complex multiple a uh, world that even a one individual contains all the time. So if we want to work with, um, if institutions want to work with um, trans, I'm not sure about the trans cis binary, but anyway, <laughs> trans people, let's use that now um, before we have something <laughs> else. Um, then like, it's not just hiring this one trans person that will tell, you know, quote unquote, the one trans perspective. Uh, it's the multiplicity uh, embracing that and, and really working with a lot of people, a lot of perspectives. Yeah. And also that's why I'm so glad to be here with you today to like, just listen to hear out what, what are your perspectives and experiences. And uh, if you want to follow my work, I have also an Instagram account, um, Taivan Isa, a little wordplay for the Finns. Um, and then I have my link tree, which is kind of like oh, my, cool. yeah, where you can see all of my um, like old writings and projects. And it's uh, I.hukka, so just my last name. But maybe you can you ha you have my Insta account on your Ormston House Insta, blah blah. Yes. Thank you so much. How about you? Yeah, I'd just like to kind of um, link into what you're saying um, about the kind of question of the, the the danger of the single story, and particularly when that means like from a representational point of view, I feel like we're always sold this idea of like representation will somehow lead us to liberation, but like it, we so easily fall into traps of tokenism, mm. um, particularly in Ireland with like moves to like EDI, like equality, diversity and inclusion and initiatives like Athena Swan. Athena Swan only covers gender equality when it means cis men and cis women. So it's like, you know, we have one tenured trans lecturer in the whole of Ireland. Um, which like means like for a lot of people, it means that they will never encounter who like they'll never be taught and they'll never get to hear trans perspectives. Um, 
And I think that like exactly what Isa said about like it can't just end with one person and particularly that whole idea um, of um, the trapdoor, that theory of like what's representation without support, it's a trap because people are ultimately going to fall into that hole where they're going to feel like their only opportunity is to be a part of an institution to gain visibility or to be part of a political group to gain visibility. But if that institution, organization, is not actively trying to help and support you, then you know, you're just gonna get lost in that machine. And I think it's actually a quote from the interview that you did with Joanna Hedva in, in The Beautiful Companion. Um, and I think Joanna said about like failing is like really important, but like failing together, that like ac all activism is failing, mm. but as long as we're doing it together, that like we're still, you know, as Munoz would say, like cruising that utopia that we'll never reach it, but we're always gonna be getting better, so. Yeah, and yeah, I find me at Ormston. I <laughs> underline <laughs> that part yeah. as well. It's really beautiful. Thank you so much, El Vishnu, Isa. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your thoughts. And thank you everybody for listening. I think we're taking a little break now. Yeah, about uh, can you hear me? Yeah. About five minutes to kind of uh, see. Just change the setting a yes. bit. And then next up we have a reading performance by William Kyohan called Boxing Day. So please come back after the break. It's a really, really beautiful performance. Thank you.
Okay, let's start. Uh, uh, this is a performance by Aeon Down. Ho hopefully it went probably somewhere, the pronunciation. And Steve Maher. Uh, it's called The Trouble with Doing a Lot with the Very Little. And it takes about an hour. Prox. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do so you want to say something first, quick, full start? I think we just break into song. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's break into song and then we can say something. And we can explain why we're doing this. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. All right. Do we run one run through and then. Sure. <laughs> A blacksmith courted me nine months and better. He fairly won my heart, wrote me a letter with his hammer in his hand. He looked quite clever, and if I was with my love. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> so, Owen. W well, wait, 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 hang on a second. Oh. So, uh, I just had to point out that we're following up some very beautiful and very profound yeah. Jackson performances. And um, this is a much more informal kind of setting, as you probably guessed from the cans. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we'll try. Are we allowed to smoke here? Or no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we'll try and bring something to this anyway. And at the very least, it'll be marginally entertaining. And uh, also, as was said before, but I just want to echo it, because I know that the performance element can be a little bit anxiety-inducing for everybody. So if anybody needs to run to use the bathroom, or they just hate what they hear... Yeah, if they want to leave. Then, you know, you can go. <laughs> we can't, though, so we'll stick to it. Yeah. We can't leave, right? No. no. Okay. Oh, hit the mic. Yeah. So why are we playing folk music? Yeah, well, you Am take I it meant away. to ask you, or are you meant to ask me? Well, I think we should both answer, because we're Let's both playing ourselves. folk music. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I came to playing folk music, uh, well, as an act of catharsis, in the same way that I came towards uh, playing uh, Gaelic sports mm -hmm. and found a community of people who I felt supported me and I felt I could support them. Uh, and while playing Gaelic sports, we uh, kind of realized that a lot of us played music as well. And we decided, well, let's continue this project of cosplaying our Irish identity. And, uh, you know, like invest fully and just become a folk band. Um, mm -hmm. So our, we're in a folk group. Uh, it's called the Helsinki Harps Folk Group. It's uh, a bit of a mouthful because we're the, the folk wing of the Gaelic Athletic of a, Association of a Club. club yeah, yeah, of a sports club, yeah. 
Uh, so we have a requirement for people to have tried Gaelic sports before they come and play it, uh, music with us as well. Uh, there's some kind of grey area with some people in the folk group, but yeah. I think um, uh, making music in general has sort of been an al alternative means of creative outlet. Like you say, it's a catharsis. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting that, well, the irony is now that we're now utilising it sort of as part of our art practice. but it was always a way to be able to do something creative that's outside of our strict practice. It seemed less academic or it wasn't going to be criticized by peers. It was something that was more personal. And um, when it came to uh, getting involved with this folk group specifically, it was pretty similar. I only came here in 2020, right at the beginning of the coronavirus. And uh, as with everybody, uh, suffered a lot of uh, isolation and inability to meet people, that kind of thing. So the easiest thing to do was find other Irish people who played ga. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't play ga, but I, it was sort of a, taken as a given that people there would come from a similar background. People would have already been exposed to some folk music or some of those local traditions or whatever. And not exclusively, because I mean, there are members of our folk group and right. of our GA club who are from all yeah. different walks of life. Um, but so but if, I, if I had met all you lads and it was like a case that you were all wearing crass patches, yeah. I could have just We'd as quickly a started a hardcore band. band yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. Well, we should anyway. We might anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it was a case that we were able to depend on everyone to have some kind of emotional connection. I'm conscious that I'm talking quite quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm unapologetic about that. I'm sorry, I'm not going to slow down. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll try to keep the accent fairly neutral anyway. Yeah, I think touching on the idea of catharsis, um, for me, like it was a case of survival, finding these communities. Um, I was pushing myself much too hard, uh, working as a cultural producer for Pixel Lake. And I think even though Pixel Lake is a wonderful community and very supportive, at the end of the day, if you're just breaking your back, it, it, it takes a toll. So I was in a very kind of awful place uh, emotionally. And uh, that's why I came to this, I think. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it was a kind of um, a need uh, to redistribute <laughs> my own personal power. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and as, as the guys were saying earlier, like, um, we are all coming together uh, with our own background and our own influences and our own interests. And we naturally fall into these sort of organic roles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not going to be able to take the squeeze box off a of Tommy or the, the no. Baron off a of Paddy. No. And they, won't, they won't take my bazooki away. No. No. But just as much uh, our personal interests and our artistic influences and all of those other personal influences are, are all contributing to what we individually bring to the collective or the band or whatever you want to yeah. call it. We also don't have uh, a top-down structure of any There's sort. No hierarchy, in what we're at least not yeah. yet. Yeah. But but these things they do organically take form over time, depending, I think, on on how it's required in order for it to continue to function. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think roles and like natural roles that people take up, are, like if it's an intuitive process, as it is, like in or a little decentralized uh, node. Um, it, it kind of, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a really, it just feels a very, like a healthy thing, you know, mm -hmm. like that we're, we're kind of being very sensitive to each other's strengths and not just in terms of our musical capabilities, you know, there are people who like are not able for the pace mm -hmm. that we were working at and it's, it was really important to respect where everyone is coming from when we're coming together like that, you know. Um, we've had a couple of changes in lineup over the last year, and we've only been together for a year. Mm. Um, but it, it's been. I didn't know you this time last year. No, you didn't. No. Mm. Yeah. I think we met at uh, Publix. We yeah. met. Oh, yeah, yeah, we did. We did. But the idea of this turning into a thing yeah. uh, happened in, as so many great deals go down, in, <laughs> in Magneti. Yeah. And we were both drunk enough that we were brave enough to sing in the archway of the pub. And then we thought we could turn this into a. I was like, do you know, you know the song, the blacksmith. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Do you know how it goes. Yeah, how's it called? Sing with me. Come on. Let's it's lash out another tune yeah. before we go on. What you want to do? Uh, we do a jig or a reel or something yeah. like that. What you want to do? Um, John Rhines. Sure. Oh. <laughs> 
So you don't come from like a musical background in terms of your family or anything like that? Actually, my dad was in a show band, but yeah. it was kind of well and truly... Can you explain yeah. what a show band is? A show band was a kind of a thing that existed in Ireland in the 60s, and it was kind of some hybridization between... Uh, well, they were all trying to look rockabilly, but didn't really know what rockabilly was. Uh, so they, they, they kind of were singing swing and lo lots of different things. But also show bands would play like trad music or country and western music because the deline delineation between those genres was uh, kind of like not so important. They w but yeah, my dad was, was, uh, he was a failed bassist, but mm -hmm. mostly a singer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's really, really hard thing to do to fail the bass as a former <laughs> bass player. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. What about you? No, but um, there was no musicians in my family. Uh, although I found out that my grandmother played the fiddle about 10 years after she died. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I obviously never saw her play the fiddle. Yeah. But um, uh, no, that's not true. My, my granddad as well uh, was a great singer. And um, I never really saw him play anything. He had a piano in the house, but my grandmother sold his piano when he was out at work one time. So maybe he wasn't all that good. But he played that in the squeeze box. And there's a bunch of songs that... You know, I never really considered our family to have be especially Irish, despite what I look like <laughs> or whatever. But um, uh, like I say, so many people, they have that, those unique connections with um, uh, having heard folk songs and stuff growing up. And folk music specifically, like um, ballads and stuff like that. It's a very Dublin tradition. Yeah, yeah. from North Dublin, it's, a, it's a really, really heavily ingrained in the sports and everything else that you do. The idea of things like jigs and reels, that's sort of for royalty. That's for yeah. the, the real Irish people who mm. live outside of Dublin. But I think that's the perception that everyone has, mm. you know, just trying to cosplay yeah. like yeah. well enough to make a convincing model, you know. Yeah. 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 It's funny, identity itself, you know, and how it plays into like the reason why we're doing this, like we, we almost have a permission to do what we're doing here. Because we're far away. Yeah. But also, you know, because it is still our thing, even though like with GAA, like, we couldn't play GAA in Ireland. And just in case you don't know what GAA is, it's Gaelic Athletic Association. It's uh, three sports, mostly. Gaelic football, which is a type of... Uh, They're not interested. I'm, well, I'm, I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, that's like, you couldn't, you couldn't play GAA I in Ireland because of just, it is very structured. It's very clicky. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas we're here, we have a license to do whatever the hell we want because mm -hmm. you know we're just weirdos anyway. We're 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 outsiders. It's okay, you know, um, and it's better to embrace that than to, you know, try to conform to some idea of how we should behave and how quietly we should be on the bus, or whatever, you know. Um, and same with folk music. I mean, th it, it's it's really a holy thing, you know. Like yeah, it's considered yeah. quite sacred. There's like musical families and that kind of thing. And I'm not talking about Catholic Church holy and not the number that no. they did in our country or anything like that. I'm talking about a more kind of like, you know. It's hard to join a session unless you're, you're confident enough that you have a, like two or three hundred songs that mm. you can sit down and play well, where you won't be taken very seriously. And it's usually fiddlers who are yep. the problem, I think. <laughs> fiddlers have a joke about playing the banjo. How do you play a banjo with a knife? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but these things are difficult to, to get into and we talked about how currently the setup in the folk band doesn't have a top down structure. Mm. Um, 
but I, I guess it probably will at some point because there, to, to kind of drag conversation into this a little bit, there was a uh, alluding earlier on to the idea of, of businesses ontology mm. and how collectives and groups and galleries and all that sort of thing, they, they naturally imitate that model because it's the ubiquitous model. It's also like when you filter through where revenue streams are coming from, mm. you know, it, it, it's where the money is sourced from. You know, when pr even though you might be part of a nonprofit, it's tax money that is like eventually trickling down in the, in the, in the Nick, icky Reagan sense, <laughs> uh, allowing us to, you know, do the things that we would like to do, you know, which we feel like phonies for doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I mean, because of that same ontology of professionalism of... I wonder will we, will we end up naturally going into, will there be, what I'm saying is will there be a front man? <laughs> <laughs> it's and Dan that, anyway, uh, yeah, because he's the Dan. loudest. Yeah. Well, um, and peace to Dan if you're listening. Yeah. But um, th there is like a kind of a, a want I think for, in, in, so I, I should tell you quickly, I, I worked in a gallery in Dublin for about six years. It was, um, it was a sort of a quasi-independent gallery. It, it ran on the back of another gallery's good graces. And but you, you, you ran this space. You weren't yeah. just working there. Yeah. yeah, but I like to give the impression that lots of people work there. Yeah, of course. All right. <laughs> so it was a case of, um, I'm sorry to overuse this term, but pay, attention, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So th there was like no funding. Uh, I wasn't aware of any potential funding other than that we couldn't apply for any of it because it was effectively just a room in another private gallery space. So we wouldn't qualify for anything anyway. But um, what, I, what interests me about this though with, with collectives and co-ops and whatnot is like um, there might be an inclination to just return to that business ontology format because it's the ubiquitous model. Because people I think tend to strive to return to what's uh, perceived as normal, even if it's only been a practice for about 100 years or 150 years. But um, in the same way that we saw the likes of people strive to return to normality uh, under coronavirus, mm. even though those very conditions could be what contributed to so many problems. And it's, to put on my Leninist Marxist hat for a second, it's, um, it's a, uh, it's the whole Gramsci thing about status quo, about society being unable to challenge the thing that's perceived as normalized. And Mark Fisher talks about it too, mm -hmm. or cultural hegemony, all that sort of thing. It's this idea that it, it, that is normality and that you can't challenge that normality of society. To do anything is to put yourself outside of society and to not really be welcome to the structure that's going so well so far. It also gives the impression that things have always been this way, but again, it, no, it came from Scotland 150 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I just think that these sort of creative env creative environments are an opportunity to to practice something that's a little bit more left field in terms of a model, uh, mainly because society, I think, will allow it. It's a permission that is given because it's right. not profit motivated. Yeah, yeah, and it's also it's just it's some incon inconsequential thing, even though it mm. like contributes more to like the cultural wealth and knowledge of, yeah, of yeah. society than anything else. But it's just allowed to be there in the corner matriculating. Um, but what, where there are often pitfalls in this, uh, especially if you work in a low resource uh, association or organization, is that we feel this weight of progress, this weight of being productive which is where I kind of fell into a hole, I think, even though I... Th I, I, I how do you, I how do you measure the value of your productivity? Uh, on, you know, as much as I'd break my body. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so this is a working class thing, I suppose. I suppose. I mean, I have a sore back right now. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> too, Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a, a, like a nine to five job in a warehouse here. Um, and, um, you know, this is great for like, healing your emotional mm. trauma and whatnot, but it's not gonna fix my back. And, yep. and, uh, and I, I kind of just have to- Maybe you should change position. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good to lie down while yeah. playing. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but it's interesting that that idea of value is only determined by how much you've grinded your bones, mm. you know? And, and you mentioned this recently, because you asked about this project going long-term. Yeah. 
how, how would you feel about like us making this into a product? Oh, I suppose m making it more marketable. Uh -huh. You know, like we're here now and we're doing this. Yeah. This, this is this is my mantra for today. We're here now and we're doing this. So you have to kind of deal with it. But like, how would you feel about us moving forward? And we've discussed this, so we're, we're going to yeah, have to play yeah. act that. No, I'd, I'd love to do it, but but yeah. briefly, uh, I'd feel like a charlatan. Yeah. Because um, I know I w I won't be able to stop driving my fork truck. I, I'm gonna. Because it won't feel like I've done an honest day's work, even if I'm completely emotionally exhausted from all the labor that goes into. Do you ever feel like an imposter when you're doing your job, like your nine to in, five? In oh, not I, really. I, I, I definitely do. I'm no. lifting lights and moving around things, and oh god, when do they'll find out? <laughs> <laughs> not really, because uh, I mean, you're you're in a big cold warehouse, and all you need to do is kind of wave and nod, and you know. There's not a lot of conversation going on. And what about on the other side of things in your non-9 to 5? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I don't know what this says about it, but I, I feel that, like I'll admit that I'm, I'm a deeply classist person. That's something that's in, like, in deeply embedded in We're me. looking up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, coming from like a working class background, having gone to art college, uh, which I you know, perceive to be the most middle class of endeavor, like a wonderful thing that you can do with your life if you can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but in those surroundings, I had to become more conscious of my accent, stuff I talked about, uh, became only more aware of class when I went to other people's houses. I realized I didn't know anybody from south of the river until I went to college, mm. which is like a, a geographical economic divide based on like a Dublin's history or Ireland's history. Um, it reminds me of being like one of the handful of people that are actually from Limerick in yeah. Limerick School of Art and Design. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, there's this weird, like, uh, yeah, it just, I can't say more for it than what you've already said, actually. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. But I see a parallel. But I think consciousness is the only thing that really matters. I mean, you're not going to find a position that's going to be helpful, um, but just being, like, aware that you are of a class and knowing, I think, that those class markers are not definable, that it's completely spectrum-based, um, in the sense that, um, you know, uh, Somebody might identify as middle class, but they consider the family next door to be working class mm. <laughs> because there might be personal circumstances in that family that were less kind to the other family. Or somebody might consider themselves middle class because they, they watch Bergman movies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, or, or, well, it's hard, even the economic models, like in the sense of like if you have a house mm. that you own, I mean, that doesn't change the fact that you grew up in a different circumstance. So you're still. I would can think still be taken away from you, even if that's you true. Yeah. 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 Well, I've always liked the idea that if you need to work to live, mm. you're working class. <laughs> and now that that depends on what you're doing, you doing with your money. But uh, if you're driving an unnecessarily expensive car or car at all, maybe or cars, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then um, yeah, those things obviously they are uh, not a determiner. Can I ask you first, you said to me before that you find it difficult to identify as working class. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just think that I see the stability of like my home life when I was a kid uh, versus the people who I grew up with and went to school with and n like have this knowledge of like a privilege that I had because of that stability, but also the p their stability that they presented was actually quite precarious. It was just a feeling that you yeah. were given as a child. Like any institution. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, I, I don't have any problem like saying it in, as an act of solidarity, mm. but I feel like a phony, you know, um, mm. because I know how hard some other people had things. And but I that's a, that supposes that just because somebody has it worse off than you. Yeah, it plays back to what you were saying. So course, really, yeah. that's, just this, that's just a form of like class drama. Um, in that it's oh, yeah, just well like it get it in line. Con, like, right, you know, right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, you're not finishing your meal. It's about creating there's, more divisions there's, between... There's starving kids who'd, who'd huh. love that meal or whatever. That's that's nonsense. Like, it, it, there's no, like, line. Every, everybody... Yeah, it's, it's, like a, it's a kind of... It's, a, it's an anti-form of solidarity to make those kind of statements. It's like what you find when giant corporations shift the blame of like ecological matters onto individuals, you know, mm. like, I mean, of course it is, because it's all late stage capitalism, uh, so, you know, yeah. I, I would also say just about Ireland in class, I saw a thread online very recently. On Reddit. I, I didn't want to say that because it's a disgusting <laughs> website, but yeah, yeah. But um, uh, the question was like, what class do you identify as? 
And um, a lot of the answers were along the lines of Ireland is a classless society, that, that there was class here when the Brits were here, and they were the upper class and we were the lower class. And this is coming from a, a country that has private schools, gated communities, mm -hmm. like let alone people. People own islands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Charlie Hawhey owned an island. Yeah, it's absurd. Yeah. But, um, a former uh, prime minister, pri prime minister, Taoiseach. Yeah, but I forget what I was going with that. I was just, I was just complaining. We do song. Which one do? Because we agreed that when we got lost, yeah, we yeah, do yeah, songs yeah, as yeah. a good way to. That, that's the con. That's that's the whole. Do you want to do a sing song? Or do you want to do a jig? I, I, I was thinking because there's a couple of uh, Limerushians or yeah, Shannon yeah. Siders here, I might do that one, yeah? Go for it, yeah. Okay. Um, so this one is called the Limerick Rake. I am a young fellow who's easy and bold in Castletown, Connor. I'm very well known in Newcastle West. I spent many years unknown. question about well about luck mm -hmm. yeah is luck a commodity you tell me um for some people mm -hmm. yeah some people are very lucky and some people are very unlucky mm -hmm. yeah but then if we're thinking about cosmic luck right. then also the same thing applies <laughs> i i would say no you'd say no <laughs> okay um I'll, I'll try and blast through it so, um, so first of all, uh, the idea of luck uh, in, as you say, the kind of cosmic concept, the kind of like karmatic kind of luck, um, I think because English is like the, the lingua franca of the world for better or worse, the way we associate luck in language and experience is determined through like the noun verb relationship. Yeah, very Anglo-centric uh, focus, of course, yeah. So yeah. We, we, our luck is spent, we run out of luck, our luck is used up, and it's a kind of like a, a finite resource that's dependent on like your morality in mm. a sort of karmatic sort of way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing. So I would say which is, which is untruthful as an atheist, so I don't, don't agree with that. Uh, and a, another would be the idea of a kind of epistemological look and a kind of moral look, like in terms of probability, like there's things that happen all the time and we can determine them as lucky or unlucky depending on what we're looking for. Mm. You know, if you, you look outside the window and there's two birds on a wire and you go, oh great, that's good luck. <laughs> because we, yeah. yeah, so we've determined that to be for one reason or another. Um, but these things happen like an infinite number of times all the time. That's just probable form. In terms of the, the moral form, um, that's I think down to uh, if, you're, if you're a relative or not because I don't like to use the idea of like pessimism and optimism, but do you know that story about, um, uh, I'll, I'll make a hack of his name so I don't remember, but there was a man who survived uh, after having been sent to work for a car manufacturer in uh, Hiroshima in 1945. And he was in an immediate like, zone of the blast, so by all means he should have died. 
He did not. He survived. He was like, you know, injured, traumatized, of course. So he went home to recover to his home city of Nagasaki. Mm-hmm. And he then survived that also, which is pretty phenomenal. So you can either look at it two ways that I can think of. He's either the luckiest person in the world or an incredibly unlucky person because he had to survive the trauma of two nuclear explosions. So it's all really relative to how it's being determined. Anyway, the short answer is no. But the <laughs> perception that people have of how lucky other people are, right? Can I hear you? Yeah, sorry. I mean, I, I think I'm not really talking about the same kind of luck. Yeah. I think I'm talking about fortune, maybe. Good fortune for some people. Well, that sounds like moral luck. Right, yeah. Well, explain what you mean by how it sounds like moral luck. I mean, the, that kind of idea that's associated with the religious information of whether it's a karmatic thing. I'm coming from a very cynical place. and looking Limerick. At some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and thinking about some people who were, in, in my, from my perspective, and, yeah. I, I, and I feel in some degrees I have been a very lucky person. I'm, yeah. s- I'm still here. Yeah. Um, that's one way. <laughs> um, but I have seen other people who are far luckier. And maybe it's coming from a, a very resentful face, a place, actually, now that I'm saying it out loud. So maybe I need to think about that <laughs> and think about myself. So maybe there's nothing there in yeah. my perspective. Um, just, it sounds a bit like it's going back to this working class aspect. Because mm. you're saying, like, I should just be appreciative for what I have and get back in line. Mm. So it sounds like it's, uh, you're kind of repeating that mantra of Yeah, trauma. I suppose I am, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Can I do another tune? Yeah. What's your fancy? Jig? Uh, uh, do a jig. Which one? Do you want to do Tour Dame de Lost? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 Let's do something a bit faster. Um, the polka. Or the cash. Let's do the polka and you do the cash. Right. Yeah. You'll start off slow, get a little faster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now imagine that, like in a bar, and you're quite drunk, and, and there's, there's like twenty other musicians all doing the yeah, exact same yeah. thing. It, it, it fills out a bit more. By yeah. the way, come to uh, our, uh, the the gig in uh, Halloween on the 29th <laughs> in Mustakisa. Um, we'll be dressed as straw boys. Um, you should Google it. Um, um, yeah. Where do we go from here? Let's do another song until we think of something to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, will I knock out maybe a quick version of Woody Winsbury? Let's do it, yeah. Uh, what fret was it? Let's go second fret. <laughs> Sleeping with a man. 
Just say about tunes again, real quick. That um, mm. one of the things about playing folk music, or I suppose any music really, is that if you're not writing it, uh, you get to live vicariously through that song and the emotions that were already pumped into that song when it was initially written or composed. And um, your association with that song obviously changes depending on like 
where you were when you heard it or events that happened in your life to that, to that song and that kind of thing. Yeah, but I wouldn't like compare, I mean, I can't explain this because, you know, when I, when I was growing up, I had friends that were in cover bands, you know, and mm. I'm sure that's what it felt like for them. But this is not what I thought that, you know, like it, there's a distinction here because there's like a perception of like an antiquity or an mm. authen authenticity. I mean, and it's a bit of a scam because actually a lot of these songs are quite modern. Um, yeah, and yeah. I sh we should really emphasize the whole like Irish music thing. It's not music which was purely sprung from the ground on this yeah. island. I mean, two of the songs we yeah. sang, one of the songs was English and one of the songs was uh, Scottish. Yeah. That last song was Scottish. Also, this is a bazooki. Yeah, and this is <laughs> and a, banjo, a banjo, you know. <laughs> uh, the origins so of this instrument are from, you know, West Africa, um, like, historically. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's folk is not something that is, like, frozen in time. It's something that's growing and mm. informing itself and living, you know. I mean, it's the name, folk, you know, mm. people. In terms of your discipline, you asked about whether you'd rather be making artwork or playing folk music, and you get to choose one. Which yeah, one I was going to ask you that, I, but I you're, you're that, asking, me that, first, asking yeah. me that. I would probably, at this point in my life, uh, play folk music, even though my uh, career as a professional folk musician is probably doomed. Um, <laughs> but you know, um, there. I feel like I've. I'm not, I'm not gonna start, stop being an artist or being involved with artistic communities, but I feel like I've done damage to myself and I would just caution everyone else not to do the same thing, <laughs> you know? How did that happen? How did that happen? Uh -huh. Well, you know, I think I already said. Huh? So you, you worked yourself to the state of exhaustion because the circumstances, you know, like <laughs> the circumstances like asked it of you. No one was asking it of me except for myself. But yeah. I think well, that I, I mean I, if, if, if we had if we had more, I think this is the this is the crux of decentralization for low resource entities. Mm. It's almost impossible because we're trying to live up to something that we can never mm -hmm. like fully do or be. You know, we 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 we're trying to be as big as Chiasma, or we're trying to be we're trying to fill all the space of Oli. And you know, we, we gave it a really good go at it, you know. Um, Why imitate those things? It's what you do, isn't it? Well, yeah. That's yeah. A, that's oh, it's, it's, it's what you're told you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I think, where it comes back to that, like that hegemonic thing about it's just what's expected. Yeah. You know, there's a standard that's set externally and you're expected to conform to that. Well, I'm much happier since I stopped putting pressure on myself and yeah. told myself that my ambition was hurting me, uh -huh. you know. All right. Yeah. Will I do that one with the har with the auto harp? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we mentioned, well, I jabbered on about language a little bit. You mm. should talk about language a little bit. You're the language yeah. guy. So, you know, this kind of goes back to what we were saying about this perception of folk music. And I've had conversations with people, uh, you know, who really love Irish traditional folk music. And of course, there are a lot of songs that have come out of Ireland, and there are airs of songs like that song Limerick Rake, The original name of that song is "Fagamitz with Martashe." It features as like one of the last lines in each of the stanzas in it. Uh, it's an older song, but it's not that old. It's like 1600s or something like that. Um, Ireland is not a monolith, you know. Like uh, even though the last. When was the centenary? Uh, well, that's a bit of a funny question, right? So, <laughs> well, my, my centenary is probably, you know, the rising, probably, I think, you know? Um, and then everything afterwards is just very murky and horrid, um, you know, probably yeah. after the Civil War, more so. Uh, right, yeah. I mean, like any, like any country, there's these questions about Civil War, you know? Mm. The country that we got isn't necessarily the country that people fought for or whatever. No. No, and a lot of people were sent off to die in Spain, and and, you know. and we, you know, it's interesting how it's been so heavily commoditized, like everything else. Mm. Like um, when you walk down Dublin and O'Connell Street into the souvenir shops, you can buy like flags and fridge magnets of like all of these. <laughs> um, I don't know what you'd strictly call them, but let's say leftist orientated syndical anarchists yeah. that were part of the rising against the British um, in 1916. And then those same people were on the losing side of the Civil War. And, um, well, that's some of those people, let's say. 
And um, it's just so strange that you can get a fridge magnet with the, the Irish Declaration of Independence, <laughs> which most people think, it seems, is our constitution. It's not. No. It's, we have a completely different one because there was a whole war that came afterwards that gave us a completely different one where we signed off the country to the church. But yep. Anyway. And that, that worked out great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, this, this song, uh, in a small way, represents the, uh, the fact that Ireland isn't a monolith. And mm -hmm. if I hadn't informed you beforehand, you might think that this song was in Irish, but it's not. It's in... A, a language which um, is extinct now, died in the 1920s. It's from the very southeast corner of Ireland. It was a language called Yola. Um, and there is written record of it where it is misattributed as a, a dialect of Middle English, although it predates Middle English. It is more in common with Frisian and modern Dutch than uh, contemporary English or middle, or, you know, middle English. Does anybody here speak Yola? Okay, good. No. Does anyone here speak Frisian? Because <laughs> you might hate me for my mispronunciations of things afterwards. But I'm sure that from accounts, what I've read was that Yola, um, it kind of sounded a, 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 like, you know, it just sounded like a bit of a messed up Dutch mixed with Norman with an Irish accent. So I think I can pull that off, hopefully. Works. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fatilzi di Lorna coione zo knagite vaitus del corcac, wafir an carni le vausana milac, tis gay an lati hak nayer yard scudi far tu zu hoki, well gas because I'd mati far tu an fade hat dai thous far gable till in zingo cladi. Ja mam zuk on a dano bole out in a the valor the speaker trace kuroke. Yester we had a barry kissing our hone, our gentries were viver and zilkunu stole. Yet Musler had a baho, twas me, Tommy, that by me stuck, twas he hit to drive in. Yow the mood frame at tree it was a hoxish baffrine and shimmering funny the fair scum such blackin on play but a ball was a drow shot fall air aim was he owls near a bow. Yeah. I messed that up a bit, but that's okay. Yeah. It, it's probably the first time anybody sang a a Yola song. In Finland? Yeah. Yeah, more pu likely. publicly. I've it's been probably the it first time for the last month, I think. Uh, probably the last time somebody sang a Yola song in a public setting was probably a church in Wexford in the 18th century. Probably, yeah. Yeah. So or, or, or even. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know how the church used to... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was in Latin, so it was mm -hmm. like, yeah. And Ireland has a lot to answer for because Ireland was the place where liturgical Latin was kind of, you know... Uh, mm. archived and saved, so then we inflicted that damage on ourselves much later on. It's so hard to imagine... Stay, guys. It's so hard to imagine the church through Ireland over the years, and I won't go on about this too much, I know I've only had one can of Murphy's, <laughs> but like, um, church pews, the seats, were only introduced in and around the early 1800s, or 1700s. So the idea of like attending mass, uh, where everybody sits down and stands and kneels and mm. all that kind of thing. Like, that's all relatively new. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. before, people would just all stand around. And it was, like, liturgical in the sense that it was musical mm. and trance-inducing and much more of a dance-orientated experience. And I wonder what link there is to this idea of the rock mass. So during Ireland's, yeah. uh, like, during the... Uh, there was a, a period of Ireland's history where there were penal laws enacted where you know, basically it was kind of like very bad to be Irish and uh, anything that you did that kind of signified that you were Irish was uh, something that you shouldn't do and you would get sent away to some other uh, part of the world uh, yeah. for, for doing so or yeah. other awful things. But the, during the penal uh, times, there were uh, mass rocks that the church held and it would be like a collective gathering around 
uh, a big a big rock, which was mm. probably a megalithic tomb that they had reappropriated as like an altar. Uh, and it might have been some other type of altar in some other religions that existed throughout Ireland, throughout its mm. history, uh, back to you know the Neolithic era. Um, but there's also there's a parallel with crossroads dancing, um, where the, these these things happened in the same places usually because it was the convergence of three to four different communities, yeah. you know, that would come together. But it kind of yeah, I, I, yeah, it's I, a real I, periphery between like families and experiences. And yeah, yeah. So some something happened along the way, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say to, I speak to often Finns these days where they'll say. Um, like the idea of a country filled with castles and towers and whatnot, mm. and like they're great, you know, mm. but um, uh, it's it's such a, I suppose, Greco-Roman centric orientated view of like what a civilization looks like, and um, I'd have to point out that things like uh, giant boulders and lakes are the equivalents of um, churches and cathedrals, of course, you know, and, and those things are much like capitalism is only 200 years old. Mm. Those things are far, far older. Yeah. And those things have been like, you know, informing communities for a great deal longer. Yeah, I think in 200 years time, we might be gathering around the rock. Well, here's hoping. Yeah. I mean, we're very close to Calio, so. <laughs> um, How are we doing for time? Are we time for another jig or another song? Well, let's ask Lucy. How are we doing for time? A few, few minutes. I think it would be a good time to do your one. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I might do a spooky song. Is a spooky song okay? Well, or it is the season. It's the season. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try something here that was part of a um, an art piece that was never really realised. It was proposed for Pixlate <laughs> 2021, <laughs> right? Um, my uh, application is uh, a lot to be desired. Fell, fell behind the radiator or something. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to sing a song just in the sense that um, we were talking earlier about how songs mean things to different people. We talked a little bit about linguistics, and I just thought this might be somewhat relevant. Um, so this is, again, not an Irish song. Okay. Oh, Peggy Gordon, you are my darling. Come sit you down upon my knee and tell to me the very reason why I am slighted so by thee. If your poor Says, Dios my eye, Muse, Wurrever, Imut Wetna, In Yamna, Nuai Utis Nacht. Big thank you to Frame for having us today and for Elle and William and 
Vishnu and Isa that came and did just amazing stuff. And uh, thanks to Owen, uh, my partner in crime here. And uh, you know, also just thanks to all the Pixel -like people who are here today. Um, you know, it, it's uh, you know, you're great people, and I'm I'm very happy to be one of you. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, it was really nice to end with the song. I really hope for it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so we have uh, still one session to go. Uh, uh, this is part of the Lapsody uh, uh, Festival uh, organized by uh, Life Art and Performance pro uh, Art Program, the May program here. Uh, so as we, as you, as I told earlier, we are kind of uh, in, in entangling with their festival, uh, the Urban Vision Project. Uh, it's a kind of conversation and visit to the installation what they have been working on, uh, and it starts from the lobby in in 15 minutes. So please go there, uh, and then tomorrow we are start uh, continuing here at 10 o'clock. Uh, and I just also want to remind you of the. Uh, installations in the other room and the Arte Util installation. So thank you for being here today. <laughs>